Now I'm going to put all of this back. I'm going to write out J in its full form and see what we get. So this implies for us now that we have partial of C with respect to time equals the source term minus divergence of J. But J we know to be minus M mobility tensor gradient mu. But mu in this case is chi prime, okay, function of C minus divergence of that tensor K which represents our interfacial energy grad C. Okay, so this bracket right parentheses closes that left one. We have that, okay? This is in omega cross time interval of interest, okay? Note something. When we didn't have these terms that, that are used to model the interfacial energy and, and are important to model phase separation and, and, and arrive at a well-posed formulation of phase separation. When we don't have these terms, we have a problem that is second order, right? Because there are two derivatives, two derivative operators, right? One coming from the gradient, the next one coming from the divergence. When we include the effect of interfacial energy, we have up to four derivative operators on C, right? And then we have these two, okay? So it's important that this relation, this PDE is fourth order in concentration. This form, which comes from assuming that from, from modeling interfacial energy is depending upon gradient of C, okay, is uh, due to Kahn and Hilliard. This formulation which begins with this way of writing that interfacial free energy is due to Kahn and Hilliard. And therefore, this, this PDE that we just put down is called the Kahn-Hilliard equation, okay? So this is the Kahn-Hilliard equation. It is a uh, very famous equation in material science. Uh, it generates some beautiful patterns which uh, you can see if you just uh, look for this uh, online, for instance, or look for papers on it. Uh, it has also uh, generated a tremendous mathematical literature, okay? I ought to mention that without this correction to the free energy, the formulation for phase separation is physically and mathematically ill-posed, okay? So phase separation formulation without that term is mathematically ill-posed, okay, it's mathematically ill-posed and physically it is um, not consistent, it does not represent what is happening, okay. It's physically wrong. And we saw the, we, 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 we talked about how this uh, uh, physical, um, 
incorrectness manifests itself in the fact that the formulation does not tell us whether the particles we get, the beta phase particles that we get, uh, organize themselves into many small particles or few large particles. Okay? And what the kahn hilliard formulation does is to penalize the amount of interface, okay? Okay? It penalizes the development of, the, of that interface and thereby gives us a unique solution for the formation of the interface, okay? So what the kahn hilliard problem does is, um, the kahn hilliard formulation does, is to say that it uh, penalizes the formation of that interface, right? And it penalizes the formation of that interface by saying that, okay, if you are going to develop these gradients in concentration that we have decided to denote with our contours, right, of concentration changing, right, from alpha, from concentration of C alpha to a concentration of C beta. Right? So it says that if you're going to develop this concentration gradient, you're going to pay a price for it. Right? And the price you're going to pay comes from this volumetric free energy. Sorry, this, this, this volume free energy which represents the interface. Right? Okay? By making us pay a price for this, it, 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 it actually makes the, the total energy of um, different arrangements of particles different, okay? So the free energy of, or the total free energy of something like this is not the same as the total free energy of uh, a situation where we have maybe the same total volume of uh, beta, but uh, separated into two uh, particles. What I've tried to represent here is that um, the total volume of, of those beta particles which have formed in these two cases, in, in this case, versus this case, right? The total volume of the beta particles is the same, okay? We have concentrations C beta on the inside of these regions, right? So I've tried to say, suggest that the total volume of the particles is the same. However, is the total interfacial uh, length the same? Think about it. Is the total interfacial length the same here? Okay. For those two cases, the total uh, volume of beta, which is V beta, is the same in the two cases, but because we have two particles in one case and one particle in the other case, right, on the slide, the case with two particles has a longer total interface between alpha and beta, but um, the length um, well, instead of length, let me say the the uh, interface the interfaces are more extensive with more beta particles, okay? And therefore, 
there is a higher penalty in the in the form of free energy one half grad C dot K grad C. Okay, because we have more region with interfaces, more points in the domain where uh, the concentration is changing from alpha to beta, from C alpha to C beta, right? Because of the fact that there is more of that stuff in, in this case with more particles, the second case here, the one with the arrow, this one, has more of this type of contribution to the, uh, to, to the total free energy from the presence of interfaces. Okay, so the two cases are different. Since the tendency is for interface, for, for the total free energy to decrease, okay, what happens is that the smaller particles disappear and larger particles are formed. Okay. Okay, this process is a process called Oswald ripening. I should also mention that the that the original, um, you know, the, the the problem that we described in this manner, where you have a little concentration bump, which grows over time. To something like this. I'm sorry. This is X and that is C, right. So if you have a little concentration bump, we talked about how with the presence of a non-convex free energy that, that concentration bump tends to grow. This process is one called spinodal decomposition. So problems of phase separation first show spinodal decomposition, and once these, these different beta and alpha particles form, they show this process of Oswald ripening. Everything driven by this, by this sort of term. Okay, and without that term, problems of phase separation are mathematically ill-posed and physically wrong. So, we've seen the PDE. What about boundary conditions? We have, as always, C function of x and time equals c bar function of position and time on the concentration boundary, okay, or the Dirichlet boundary. We also have minus j dot n, our flux condition, okay, equals j bar on this part of the boundary. But note, however, that now what is the concentration, what is the, what is the, the flux? The flux is, so, so we get a minus, and remember J is minus M gradient mu. But what is mu? Mu is chi prime of C minus divergence of K grad C. Okay, that is what this thing is. It's a much more complicated boundary condition. This is our flux boundary condition, alternately our Neumann boundary condition, um, or uh, our um, 
natural boundary condition. There is a further boundary condition. Because our partial differential equation is fourth order, it is not enough to have just two, two boundary conditions. We need more boundary conditions, okay? Another uh, physically and mathematically consistent way to specify another boundary condition is something that came out of our variational formulation, right? Do you remember what that was? We saw that the variational formulation, in order to have equilibrium, okay, gives us an additional condition on the boundary, okay? So we can have an additional boundary condition which we, we may call an equilibrium boundary condition. Comes out of the variational arguments, right? And, that, and, and, and so, it, so it says that if you want the system to evolve towards, towards equilibrium, at equilibrium, you also need another condition which uh, turned out to be K grad C, the whole dotted with N equals zero on all of the boundary, okay? So this is the condition we also need to have if we want to see the system ever evolve towards equilibrium, okay? Um, I won't state it, or I, I'll state it, but I won't prove it. But in this, uh, but in this setting, because of the variational treatment and so on, this is what we call a higher order boundary condition. Okay. It's called higher order because it comes about simply from the fact that we have a fourth order partial differential equation. Be the, the, the variational treatment tells us that this too is a Dirichlet type boundary condition. It's a Dirichlet type boundary condition not on the, on the concentration itself, but it is on grad C, right? It's, 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 well, it's really properly on grad C, k grad C dot n. Okay, it's a Dirichlet or essential type of boundary condition. Um, a great deal more can be said about it, but I will just stop it at here, at, at this point. Um, of course, if we intend that the system should never reach, reach equilibrium, we don't need to have this equilibrium boundary conditions. You can have other types of higher order boundary conditions. Uh, and to understand them and, and to get into discussion about them really calls for a much more detailed uh, treatment of, the, of this sort of problem. I should mention that this kahn hillier problem is very rich. Uh, mathematically, it generates tremendous patterns. It's been applied to all kinds of problems, not just in phase separation for solids, but also fluids and other problems which have nothing to do with phase separation. Uh, and it has gen generated a tremendous mathematical literature of its uh, own. Okay, we'll stop here with this segment.